something a little different tonight. Um, I think, so I'm not going to teach, I'm not going to preach. Uh, the difference between teaching and preaching is just volume anyway. Hello. So, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to minister a word to everybody that's here. And ministering is different than preaching. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about something that I felt James asked me to talk about. But to be fair, I didn't have my hearing aids at, at that point. So I'm, <laughs> and he was a little bit in tongues and I didn't have the interpretation. So uh, I am going to talk about the spirit of Elijah. And, uh, and then I thought he asked me to speak as a father, but I think he meant as a father of the city. So I'm going to speak on hearts that turn. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the last verse in the Old Testament. It's the uh, last book in the Old Testament. It is um, that Italian prophet, Malachi, chapter 4, Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. I have my, uh, I got some scriptures here. And um, this, is, this is, I want to talk like... Um, like we, we have an ongoing revelation of God, don't we? And tonight I, I think that what the Lord wants to do is give you a fresh revelation of who he is as father. That's why that song would just touch my heart so deeply tonight. And we're told like the, like the last verse of the Old Testament, like a, like a javelin going in the wall and holding on for the next 400 silent years. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The NIV says a curse. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. What's going on? Elijah was around a few hundred years before this. But he said, before the great and awesome day of the Lord before he returned, he was going to send Elijah again. How does that work? And, and maybe a more uh, ambiguous question might be, how do hearts turn? So if a heart can turn one way, it can turn another way. Am I right? Just nod if I'm right. If a heart turns, it can turn both ways. So what's going to happen tonight is your heart, you'll have the opportunity for your heart to turn a little bit. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to help you with that, I hope. Um, the Father's blessing seems to be the opposite of a curse. So what he's referring to here is not like a voodoo curse. He's... He's, he's referring to the absence of blessing. And you'll remember of Elisha when he, he tricked, or Esau, he was tricked out of his blessing by Jake the snake, his deceiver brother, Jacob. And, and he comes up later right after the blessing was given, and this is mysterious to me, I don't have any revelation on why he couldn't give another blessing. I think there's an unlimited amount of blessing. There is today. And for some reason, he was not able to give another blessing because he gave the first child's blessing. And so, so Esau comes along and he's so upset and he makes this cry, as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, Genesis 27, verse 34, as soon as he heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, said to his father, bless me also, O my father. Can I tell you that I hear this more than ever as a cry in the spirit today among this generation? Um. I personally believe that there's a father-shaped vacuum inside of every human. Here's what we have in common. We all have fathers. That's, as the, that's the noun. But it's also a verb. Have we been fathered? That's different. 
To have a father requires a reason, reasonable sperm count and decent blood pressure. <laughs> Selah. But to be fathered takes a life. To pour your life into another requires you giving up your life for another. If I were to ask you, what was your father like? Because the most critical factor of you seeing God as father is how you see your earthly father. If I were to ask you to describe to me what your father is like, you may even say to me, which one? Is it because you're not sure what he's going to be like when he comes home? Maybe you've had that type of a father. Um, life for many is the frustrating need looking for the affirmation of a father. Jesus said in Psalm 68, so it, said, it was said of Jesus that he would be the father of the fatherless. And we're told of God, one of his names is everlasting father. And when we pray, we're even to begin our prayers by saying our father. When when the disciples asked Jesus, tell us what the Father's like, he said, well, if you've seen me, you've seen him. A few years ago, we were at a conference with a uh, pastor called Bill Johnson, who pastors a little church in Redding, California, a rockin' church. Um, and he said this, he said, I read through the New Testament one year asking one question why did Jesus, the Son of God, come to earth? And he said, the answer surprised me, the answer that he received. Because the answer that he received that he had never noticed before, well, of course, he's to forgive sin and redeem the world. And, but the answer that he heard in his heart was to reveal the Father. That's quite a thing. I'm not sure if you knew that or not. One of the functions of Jesus was to reveal the Father. Many hearts will turn tonight and reverse the curse of fatherlessness. Um, I recall the carefree days growing up on the farm in northern Saskatchewan, working a lot with my father. I had a good father. Many of you had good fathers. Uh, none of us had perfect fathers, but there is a perfect father. You are perfect in all of your ways. So, and uh, he passed away in 2006, and I was at his side uh, probably about a year before he passed away. I went to him and asked him a question because I'd never heard him. And, and I don't know if you've ever felt this or not, but there's words that only a father can speak to a child. They can hear them from other people, but until the father says them, they somehow don't drop into that place in our heart that has that void waiting for the Father's words. And I asked him this question. I said, Dad, are you proud of me? And he said, of course I'm proud of you. And why do you have to ask? And I said, I've never heard it. And I asked the Lord about that. I said, why, why couldn't he say something simple like that? Because it's all I really wanted to hear from my dad. And, I, and if I've ever heard the Lord, I think he said so clearly to me, it's because he said, it's because your dad never heard those words. And he can't say what he's never heard. A beautiful thing about Pastor James, uh, shortly after we met, he sent me a text and told me he loved me. No, 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 but he may, well, maybe said it's all you. I, I felt special. <laughs> I, I felt, felt really special. You know why he's able to say that? Because he's heard that. If you haven't heard it, you can't say it. Other people can say it, but it doesn't ring true and you feel fake. If you say something, but when your father says something and it goes into that deep place in you known as your heart, it changes your DNA and your chemistry for life. Even so, bless me, Father. <clears throat> um, what if, I mean, I know, maybe we've misunderstood the offer of Christianity, but what if, um, because of course forgiveness was offered, but what if forgiveness was offered to make a way so that we could come back to the Father. 
Every boy needs the active intervention of his father as well as a company of good men. And that's because masculinity is bestowed and imparted and transferred. Boys learn who they are and what they are made from, from a, their father and a company of men. It's not learned or imparted from a woman or in isolation. A little girl needs to hear something too from her father because she needs his affirmation and his attention. And that little girl, she doesn't hear those words of affirmation and affection from her father. She'll look for them someplace else, but they'll never really satisfy until she's heard them from her father. The beautiful thing is tonight that we can be refathered. You can all be refathered by a perfect father who is perfect in all of his ways. Fatherlessness is a crisis in our culture. The Bible calls it a curse. 90% of runaways come from fatherless homes. 85% of behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicide, 71% of pregnant teens looking for the affection of their father. 85% of youth in prison. You're 10 times more likely to use drugs if you came from a fatherless home. You're four times more likely to live in poverty. And you're 14 times more likely to commit rape. That's staggering. The most strategic time in the development of a human being, I believe, is somewhere between 10 and 14. And wouldn't you know it, but the enemy uses that time to strike an arrow deep into the heart of many sons and daughters. I know it happened for me. The, and the arrow came at such an important time in my development. Fathers are meant to be protectors, and I was unprotected. In... In a father's life, there's four seasons, and there's something like this. Between the age of zero and five, what you need your father for is nurture. Between the ages of six and 12, you need him as a lawgiver. Between the ages of 13 to 20, you need him as a coach. And 20 years and over, you need him just as a mentor. Many of you had fathers that are awesome in one of those and maybe two of those, but it's very rare that you find a father that's great in all of those. And through different seasons of life, we need different things from our dads. One of the most fulfilling and the most demanding for me has been fathering. It's, been, it's had the, most, the greatest joys and the deepest regrets. When I talk to fathers about how they feel, many of them are riddled with regrets, wish we could have done better. <clears throat> My most massive wins as a father. We're told when we receive the spirit of Christ that we receive not the spirit of slavery, Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 and 16 say, to fall back into fear, but we receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Intimacy and authority. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. When we receive the spirit of adoption, when that takes place in our life, it affirms our family, our destiny, our self-image and our security. The father speaks destiny. They're, we're designed to speak destiny over our kids. If you didn't receive words of destiny from your dad, your heavenly dad is here tonight to speak them over you. Father, father's words are creative forces. And the role of a father is to affirm identity. And, and, and when I talk to um, doctors, so I might be wrong, I've only talked to three. But what they've said to me is that father is the one that determines the gender. Hello, can I go there? No, I guess not. It's kind of quiet in the church tonight. No, but here's what I want to say, but I wonder if gender confusion is a result of, of not being affirmed as a child of who you are. What if? The absence of the father's voice. I can tell when a young girl has missed the words of her father. 
My heart can literally ache. What do we do with our fathers? We forgive them. That's what we do. Fathers affirm identity by answering our questions, personal words, actions, stories. The four outcomes of a father are identity, intimacy, influence, and inheritance. Fathers have the power to reverse curses of illegitimacy. Where do I belong? Where am I from? We have a father who said he would never leave us as orphans. Ladies often wonder, am I beautiful? That question can't be answered by a teenage boy. It needs to be answered by a father. The best time and the most strategic time to hear those words are somewhere between 10 and 14. Every, every husband is a son. The fact is, he's his father's son. The bad news is all of us fathers are broken. I'm a good dad, but I'm broken. I'm not a perfect dad. I made so many mistakes, but I'm learning. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I've had the privilege of being refathered by my heavenly father. Father's role is to connect. Father's role is to protect. Father's role is to correct, bring correction. It was always the father's role in the Old Testament to circumcise the sons, bring correction. In the New Testament, that's to circumcise the heart, cut away the flesh. Did somebody, did you have somebody that you could take your big questions to? Fathers are narrators. I just, this story takes us, uh, it's, has a, this great outworking in Luke chapter 15. The story of the prodigal son, it's really the story of the father's heart. And if you want a picture of the father's heart, what a father's heart's like. It said that to illustrate his point, a man had two fathers. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now and instead of waiting until you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between the sons. It's interesting that word wealth is word bios. It means life. He divided his life. He divided his life between his two sons. He gave everything for his sons. That's what the father is like. And a few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings, took a trip to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. And about that time, the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. You probably know this story. Lord, help it be personal tonight. Boy became so hungry, even the pods he was feeding looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even my hired men have enough food to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father, and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. So he returned home to his father. This is what he's like. Your father, your heavenly father is waiting and watching. And while he saw him at a long distance, his father saw him coming. He filled with love and compassion. Your heavenly father's like this. He's filled with love and compassion. He runs to him and he embraces him and kisses him. And he says, his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, quick, get a robe, cover him. And put on him, and put it on him, get a ring and put it on his finger and sandals on his feet and kill the calf. We've been fattening in the pen. We have, we have to celebrate. I love that. We must celebrate. One of the things your heavenly daddy loves is you celebrate. He loves to party. I don't know if you know that about him or not. He loves to laugh too. Um, he is re- and, and he is now returned. He was lost and now he's found. And so the party began. It's a very powerful scene. But we know that the story is about two sons. Neither one of them had the father's heart. We emphasize the first one because we all can identify that we've all ran away from the father's house. I mean, for me, at a very young age, I became a drug dealer and, uh, and um, you know, on and on and on, all that, you know, all that stuff for a long time. And, um, but I didn't understand what the father was like. And I was missing some words. This little boy's heart had a vacancy in it because he's spent lots of time with his dad, but he's never heard words from his dad. In the beginning, there's an anger towards the father. It's like a death wish is what it is. And he asks for his inheritance. Father's heart is turned and he's willing to take the hits for his son. He goes bankrupt for him because, and the son takes off with half of the, the, the estate and, and he spends it on cheap whores and high-stakes poker in Las Vegas. Something like that. 
Um, it's quite a thing, but the father is waiting and he's filled with love and compassion. If you read this chapter, you'll find nine qualities of a son or a daughter, and you'll find nine qualities of a father. Well, we, we won't be doing that tonight. But they're all there. This is profound for me. Because, because the son says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Well, what happens when we leave the father and run away on our own? We, we pretty soon start, we waste our life, and then what, when we get knocked down by sin, then shame keeps us down. He said, I'm just not worthy. What does the father do? With the, with the speech that he's rehearsed, he doesn't let him say it. He's, ultimately, what your heavenly father is saying to you is shame off you, not on you. He said, the son would say, I'm no longer worthy. The father says, no, 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 you're my son. Here's the other thing. Of course you're worthy. And I'm going to give you the family credit card again. And he gives him a ring. Of course you're worthy. And he covers him. A father's job, a, a role of a father. This is what I see when I in ministry so much. A, a, a spiritual father's job is to cover his sons with garments of praise. And when they don't get words of praise from a spiritual father, they look everywhere, especially online, for words of affirmation. How many likes can I get? When a, father, when a father doesn't correct a spiritual son, when he doesn't cut away the fleshly part of him, the other danger is he can go too far, far, way too far, and he can make him unable, he cuts a bit too much, and he makes him unable to reproduce. I've seen that in ministry sons as well, where the father has cut them so much that they're unable to reproduce because of the father's insecurity. You don't know how many good-hearted, anointed men and women that I've met that are bleeding because they've been in a house that didn't praise them, didn't affirm them. They haven't heard those words. All they've heard is what all of their faults are, and they're not living up to the standards of this certain insecure father that needs to see them act and be a certain way. Dress a certain way, act a certain way. Let me narrate the story. Fathers are narrators. Life only makes sense in a narrative. You wonder where you fit in the story. One of the father's jobs is to narrate your story, to manage your memories. The, 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 the greatest determining factor of emotional stability in a child is not how many times, who put that speaker there? <laughs> Was that there a minute ago? Is that my first time around the pulpit? I'm going back. I need some room. I'm not hiding behind that. Where was I? <laughs> Just a minute. Where was I? Oh, the most uh, significant indicator of emotional stability in a child. It's not how many times they've been to Disneyland. Do you want to know, you want to know what it is? That they know where they fit in the family story. That you belong. You are my son. You are my daughter. You were planned and you have a purpose. The words, when God spoke audibly in the New Testament, it was only two, maybe three times, they were always to affirm the son. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The pride of my life. At which time when he said it in Matthew chapter four, Jesus had not performed any miracles, cast out any demons. What he's done is he's, is he's stayed hidden until his time. You have an everlasting father. He wants you to know you're loved, you're forgiven, you're part of a family, you're a son or a daughter. You don't need to wallow in the regrets of your past. Just turn and come home. It's safe. It's safe to come home. You can trust me. You can receive full rights as a son of daughter. And I'll put my signet ring on your finger and I'll cover you with the family robe. Some of the questions, you know, Matthew chapter 7, there's some questions. Jesus says, um, uh, you fathers, you parents, when, you're, when, you're, when your son asks you for bread, do you give him a stone? He's, he, he, we read right on to the answer. If he asks for a fish, do you give him a scorpion or a snake? 
we read right on really quickly. But you know what he's doing? He's uncovering one of the deep fears in our hearts. Is will our father provide? It's a fear. We wonder. We have a question. And then he says this. If you being evil, if you being evil... Because no well-adjusted father would ever say, Dad, can I have some bread? No, 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 it's a rock for you. <laughs> no one would do that, right? But he's, wait, he's scanning the audience. He's looking at the eyes. He's looking at them and he's saying, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if we, I can uncover this one fear what, that I'm a good father. So he says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more? Yeah. Your heaven, how much more? The son says this. He says, I know what my father's like. The kids, the people back home, they got more than enough food. Do you know your heavenly daddy like that? He's got more than enough provision for you. More than enough provision for you. And if you're a son or a daughter, then an heir, you have every right to ask and expect, but not work for it. He said, you're not working for it. That's called religion. That's called performance. A son as an heir doesn't have to work. He's got shoes on. Slaves had no shoes. Well, literally sandals, I guess. But you know what I mean. They likely weren't Birkenstocks. <laughs> the father affirms the identity. Okay, so he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I would not leave you as orphans. Orphans, orphans have to beg. Orphans have to survive. Or, orphans hoard. Kelly, don't say nothing. They're self-focused. They struggle for identity. They have no inheritance, no blessing, no home. Um, fathers have the power to reverse these curses of illegitimacy. Both the sons needed a revelation of the father. They, so, so Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the father. Two more quick points, and then I'm going to invite your hearts to turn. And many of you will. I know it. No, no, I heard it. I know they will. Fathers are warriors. They use words and actions to restore dignity of daughterhood. Daughters get no sense of belonging if the father's silent. The question I would ask you today is were the words you heard from your father more harmful or the words that you never heard? My hunch, my hunch is the words you never heard, but you had a cry in your heart to hear them. My Bible says that the spirit of Elijah is going to be released. And if you can receive it, in, in verse um, uh, Luke chapter, no, Matthew 11, verse 14. If you're willing to accept it, he uh, is Elijah who is to come. He's referring to John the Baptist. He said in Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 17, what would take place is when this one, John the Baptist, when he comes, he's going to release the spirit of Elijah and turn the hearts of fathers to kids, I'm here to say that my heart has turned. Will your heart turn? I'm not a great father, but my heart has turned. I'm here to plead with you tonight and minister this word and make this invitation. Would you allow your heart to turn today towards a good, good father? If so, your entire paradigm could shift tonight. So, um, I know where I am. I know where I am. The questions that, that daughters have in their hearts. See, the, the question of a son is, am I strong? question of a woman is, am I a young girl? Is, am I pretty? Come out and dance in front of dad. Daddy, am I pretty? If you didn't hear you are pretty, you're still looking in the mirror today, wondering, am I pretty? And young boys, they don't look in the mirror to see if they're pretty. They're looking at their biceps. No, am I right? Pretty is not that you want to be pretty. You want to have some guns. No, isn't it right though? You wonder, do I have do I have what it takes to make it in the world? If your father didn't affirm that, you still wonder, and you're trying to prove it. The little girl that didn't hear wasn't affirmed. You're a beautiful princess. I carry you in my heart. You're treasured. You're precious. If you didn't hear those words, the words that you never heard are questions that you're still asking. Where do you take those questions? Dear Lord, don't take them to Facebook. <laughs> or whatever. Maybe what, TikTok? TikTok. I don't know what that is. I was asking my kids about 
fans only the other day and they said <laughs> okay now you come alive I haven't had an amen all night oh they said it's not fans only it's only fans did you know that I'm pointing at the one behind you where do you take your questions where do you take your questions There's probably, uh, you see, I'm like, I'm a geezer. I don't, I'm an old guy. So, so when my daughter turned about 14 and started to blossom and bloom, you got a loony bunch here, buddy. Uh, that's it. That, uh, Okay, but, but here's what happened, is, is because at that time when she needs to know that she's a little bit awkward in this new body, am I okay, Dad? And if a dad doesn't stay close because of our insecurity, I regret this so much because I didn't know what to do. And my fear and insecurity as a man and a father. She pushed me away, you know. I wanted to give her a hug. We used to always hug and snuggle. And all of a sudden, you know, hugging and snuggling. She's a little bit awkward. And she pushed me away. And, and I thought, oh, good, I'm off the hook. And so I went for a walk. And I said, Lord, she's yours. And he said, no, I gave her to you. And what she wants to know is as she's changing and going through changes in life, is, there a, is her dad a warrior that'll fight for her in spite of himself? I was filleted. We understand that language? I was messed up. Um... I'm, I needed her to know that she was worth pursuing. <clears throat> and the question their hearts might be is, will a man walk out of my place of confusion and disappointment? Or is there one really on a white horse that would rise up and on his thigh is tattooed faithful and true? The little girl's just waiting for the white horse to come. He's coming. He's coming on a white horse. Revelation, he is faithful and he's true. The primary quality of a warrior is not just the fight, but the won't run from responsibilities, but stand in the face of the enemy. It's every woman's hope and every daughter's dream that a dad will stand. Did yours? The father's role is to identify lies that stand in the way of the destiny of his daughters and sons and reverse them with redemptive truths and use his voice and name those mountains and move those mountains in Jesus' name. I remember it was, I got, I got saved in 1981, and, um, <clears throat> and it was in 1993 that a man, a good man, laid hands on me. I remember we, I was at a seminary course, he laid his hands on me, and he called forth the spirit of, mass of a man or something. I can't remember what he said, but I've never before, the Bible says that you'll hear in your spirit, Abba, Father. I couldn't hear that. Have you heard that in your hearts? If so, you've been blessed with a good dad who, were, who you knew, both his authority and his intimacy. I never knew that. There's no father who has Abba fathered perfectly but one. And I wanted to get, um, I mean, for me anyway, I wanted to remove the garbage in my little girl's life so that she could get there. Show us the father. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. And my last point, fathers tell the stories. I propose what's missing in many of our lives is the Father's voice, His presence. And we're not sure if He's, what, if, if, we know He's around, but we're not sure, is He good? Is He kind? Will He say words of, like, I love that we went over that. Thank you for going over and over in that about His love. Thank you for doing that. Um, 
trying to think of what my daughters needed was just part of the battle. I was good, I was present, but I wanted to enter their world, but I was ill-equipped. And, um, and so I think what I want to do tonight is I want to I want to do what we would call identificational repentance or identificational intercession. And I invite the band to come back and kind of cord through that last little bit on, on a good, good father. The, the blessing, as I understand it, a father's blessing, it's the covenantal transfer of the favor of God for the future of every child. And if you haven't received the Father's blessing and you're not living under that blessing, you're living with the absence of that blessing and for many you're still looking for that blessing. So I'm just going to ask the band to come again. <laughs> They're here. Um, I, I need, and, I, and, and I need you in these next few moments, I, don't, I didn't put this up on the screen because I didn't want you reading it. I want to... I want to ask on behalf of your fathers for forgiveness where we failed as fathers. And then into that void, I want to speak blessing. I, it, I mean, this is one of the things that I can do as a father. I know some of my limitations as a pastor, preacher, or something, but... I know, what, I know what we can do tonight, and I know what the Lord wants to do. Is he told me as I sat down, he said, I will if you will. I said, I'll do it. He said, I will too. I'll turn their hearts. The invitation will be to turn your heart. I'll, I would like you all to stand, if you would, please. And I would like you... Of course, you're not turning your heart to your earthly father. You're not turning your heart to me. I'm representing your father's. But if you, if you will, he will. If you're willing to let your heart turn. Because the Father's heart's turned to you. Either put your hand over your heart or just kind of close your eyes. And your, your heart basically, it's the doorway between your spirit and your soul, I think. We're three-part beings. And <clears throat> it's what regulates, moves from your pure, perfect spirit of Christ into your soul. Romans chapter 10 says that you carry in your heart beliefs, your beliefs, your core beliefs are carried in your heart as are your core wounds let these words listen and kind of nod if you agree like just sort of say yes in your heart you don't need to say this, this is just Holy Spirit, these sacred moments like this they just blow my mind because you can do a personal work in a nanosecond that I couldn't do all night ranting away and stumbling over myself. But you can do it. You've done it. I've seen you do this, and I'm asking you to do it again. The hearts of the, these beautiful sons and daughters at this strategic time in their life. So I want to hear, hear this from the Heavenly Father's heart on behalf of your earthly father. On behalf of your father's Will you forgive us for not, for not guarding your hearts or speaking words of life over you like the true warrior heart of a whole father? Please forgive us. Please forgive us, fathers, for not speaking destiny and blessing and courage and life when you needed to hear it from us the most. I'm so sorry. I was silent when I needed to speak up and you didn't know where to take your questions. I wasn't there and I'm so sorry. Forgive us as fathers for not being there to answer your questions, to tell you stories or affirm your identity or connect you to your family, your home and our heart. You have a place in this world. Tonight I ask you to release us as fathers from our passivity when you needed to hear that you were welcomed and wanted and worthy of our love and attention. Forgive me for the anger that rose up in your heart because of my absence and silence and fear. Instead, you were left on your own, and I'm so sorry for that. Forgive us for not protecting you and placing our shields of faith over you. We never even knew we had one. And we left you vulnerable to a culture of criticism, comparison, and words of strangers when you needed our love 
and affirmation and words of truth and encouragement. We never knew how to protect your heart, your dreams, your design, or your destiny. I'm so sorry. Forgive us as fathers for not fighting for you, but instead leaving you to fight for yourselves. Today, I remove the lie that you're not worth fighting for. We lacked courage, initiative, and bravery. This is my fault, and I'm deeply sorry that you had to bear that wound alone. That was not your fault. Forgive me as a father for withholding words of life out of my insecurities. Tonight, I reverse those unspoken words and replace them with words of life. Daughter, you are beautiful. You will make a gorgeous bride and a wonderful mom. Stop comparing yourself. There's no one else on earth like you. Sons, you are brave and bold and strong. You'll make good men, great husbands and loving fathers. I speak over you, sons, the blessing of identity. You are a man. You are a strong. You are a son of a strong, courageous father, and you are strong and courageous as well. I can see that in your future. Young women, may the Lord give you a revelation of your personal beauty. You are precious, you are priceless, and you are cherished. You are a pearl of great price, and I would buy the whole field to find you. You are worth fighting for, and you always will be. You are unique and gifted and wonderfully made. Your body is perfectly formed and fashioned for your purpose on the earth. You bring great delight to your Father's heart. Heavenly Father, I ask you to richly bless these young men and women in all the places where their fathers fail. Tonight, I bless your life with purpose and power to live out your days with faith, hope, and love. I bless your life with courage, and I bless your life with godly choices and godly wisdom. I bless your relationship with your parents, your spouses, your children, your friends, your community, and especially with Christ. May, may others treat you well and no evil come nigh or near your dwelling. I bless your life with passion to fulfill your desires and your dreams and your destiny. I bless every one of your days with fruitfulness. I speak increase to all of your accomplishments. May you prosper and be in excellent health all the days of your life. Hear these words, you are the pride of my life and our family. You are safe to be yourself and secure in my love. I will carry you in my heart and in you I am fully and completely pleased. You are the pride of my life and the joy of my heart. You are the child of a great king, a great warrior, the everlasting father. You are deeply loved, you are chosen, you are perfect, you were planned, you are precious. Today I remove from you any belief that you are not wanted or loved or belong because you do. And your heavenly father loves you just the way you are and he will never leave you, he will never forsake you all the days of your life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.